So I'm always behind on my memes. Is this still a thing? <laughs> it's, it's the only image I have in my entire slide deck. I thought I'd just hail Mary that. Uh, my name is Jack Danger. Uh, I'm very privileged to be an engineer at Square. If you don't know what that is, please come see me later. I'll give you this cool little piece of uh, electronics that we built that lets you swipe a credit card with only an iPhone or an iPod or an Android phone. It's really cool. Um, there was a lot of work that we have to do to run a giant financial system with a small team. So if you're good at anything, please come work for us. We could really use you. Um, also, three catered meals a day. That's pretty good. Uh, so I've been doing Ruby for a while, and I've made a lot of mistakes. And this presentation is what I've learned. I would like to talk about strong code. This is a made-up BS term that I coined for this talk, but it's also something that I, I talk about a lot, and um, it's very important to me. Yeah, I think it's very significant. Um, I talk about code in terms of strong and weak on a regular basis. Uh, the strong code is the kind of code I define it as a... Um, so there are many aspects of code, of design. Um, there are many patterns we've talked about, but I talk about code as uh, not a running process that's strong, like it's efficient or powerful, but the source code itself as being strong. It means it's resilient. It is a, a platform on which you can trust future changes. It is a, it is a, a firm foundation, um, and it is a pleasure to work with. Uh, it's generally something that you can add whatever you're imagining to it because it's been prepared for you in anticipation of your needs. I think this is very strong, just like if you get in a jam, you want something strong to save you, when your business explodes or crumbles or pivots, you need a code base that is strong that can save you. Uh, I've been stuck without one. Um, I, I don't recommend it. Um, a loose definition of this, again, this is, this is resilience. This is the firmness of its foundation, its ability to adapt. Uh, there are three primary things that make code strong. One is that it's functionally correct. This is like, this is what patterns you employ and how you write your tests and whether you have good tests. And there's a lot of really smart people here who know far more about that than I do, so I'm going to delegate to them. Um, the, second, uh, the second one and third one are the ones I'm going to talk about. Uh, strong code, you can identify it easily. It's, it's fun, it's easy for you to edit it. You sit down and you think, I know what to do. I'm going to edit this code. Uh, and it's easy for others to edit. Not just other people on your team who are not you, though that too, but people who weren't there when it was written, people who come after, people who you hire, people who replace you when you go on to the next new shiny, um, and people who find it running in production, perhaps running something very important, long down the road. Right, so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, functionally correct, keep, write good tests, right? Please have tests. But let's talk about what makes code easy for you to edit. Uh, there are lots of things that make it easy. One, pick Ruby. That's great. Um, don't pick a language that is hard to edit. Like, Haskell is cool. I want to learn it better. I, I don't hear people talking about, ah, thank goodness I wrote this in Haskell, so the rewrite will be simple. Like, not really. <laughs> uh, Java gets a lot of flack. It's actually not so bad, but bad Java is really bad to edit. Uh, you don't know what's going on. So I'm going to talk about one aspect that uh, is universal. And no matter what background you have or what sort of operation you work with, even if you're a sysadmin or a designer, this one is significant. Uh, this will make any code base weak. And uh, it's size. But it's not really size, right? It's size. It's when it gets really obscene. This is the fat models that can't get out the door. This is a significant problem. Uh, Steve Yeggy wrote in 2007 on a blog post with loads of comments debating this, that the worst thing that can happen to a code base is size. Now, that's a statement by a popular developer that a lot of people pay attention to. And it has a lot of confidence behind it. So you should immediately disregard it. Because that is not fact, that is anecdote that is supported by social proof, so you are biased toward believing it, even if it's false. Uh, it happens to be true, I think. But <laughs> if, just because I put it in my slides and it's way up there doesn't mean it's real. However, these guys did, did like, statistics and math and stuff, uh, and they measured things, and they found the same thing. So I happen to paraphrase this very seriously. Like, this, it's really not what they said. But, um, this is what the summation of their abstract is. They just took three paragraphs to say it. Specific complexity measurements are not correlated with post-release fault rates, in, except in so much as they are a function of project size. So what these guys did is they measured many projects, and they measured, they used various complexity measurements, cyclic complexity, uh, number of function pointers, class size, number of files, all kinds of things, 
Um, and they compared that to the post-release fault rates, which means bugs in production. And they found that higher complexity measurements were strongly correlated with even higher numbers of bugs in production. Um, what these guys did, well, actually, that was many studies before them, so people believed that that was, that was the case. Complexity yields bugs. What these guys did is they controlled for the project size. They said, okay, complexity divided by project size, how does that work out? And they found that, actually, project size is the only thing that results in an increase in bugs in production. The metrics were just measuring, like there are higher metrics of complexity, were simply an artifact of it's a bigger project, so it has more complex things in it. Um, so really, the, like, pay attention to the complexity. I'm writing a little app right now to, like, to help measure complexity, um, and I'll have more information on that later in the slides, but project size is the real killer. That's what gets bugs into production, that's what makes code weak, that's what makes it hard to edit, that's what makes the early Rails app that ran all its tests in five seconds, little green dots going across the screen, before you got distracted by Twitter, that you could go back and keep iterating on. That's what size turned that into that thing where you iterate twice a day instead of 200 times a day, where you add one feature every couple of days slowly with a team, rather than nine features in an afternoon. Uh, and it doesn't have to be this way. Think about your application as a graph of nodes. Each thing that does something is a node. Pretty easy to imagine in an object-oriented space. Do I have a timer, by the way? All right, well, just let me know when I'm running out of time. Uh, there's, um, so each of these, let's imagine they're like a user, model, some sort of mailing system. This is your 15-minute blog. This is your intro to Rails. This is your first few things you've constructed that uh, get you going. Now, your actual application is vastly more complex than this, because you can build this in 15 minutes. But let's say it's this. Now, let's look at all the ways that these pieces can connect to each other. Uh, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I did a lot of like, counting, and I keep forgetting this number. I keep having to recount this. So it, it, it's a lot. Um, but the actual math is it's uh, the number of, of nodes, of pieces in this graph, minus 1 squared plus that number of nodes again, divided by 2, is the number of vertices possible in your graph. It's the number of ways that your things can connect to each other. So as you add more nodes, you add more possible vertices, which adds more expressive features, more possible application value, but definitely more size and definitely more complexity, and a very real complexity. Now, if you have four things, that's 10 ways to connect them. It's simple. You can't go wrong. It's really hard. If you have 20 things, 190 ways to express them. Now you can do something interesting. Now you have an application. Now, 150 things, and you have over 11,000 ways to compare them, each one. And that's just one-to-one. -one. That's not like three of them connected. So how are you going to spec out the combination of 11-plus thousand things? You're not. There's going to be holes in your test coverage. There's going to be confusion. Much less, can anyone read that much code, right? But uh, I've worked on Rails apps with more than 150 models. That's not counting as many controllers, uh, lots of things thrown into lib or initializers, and then a whole spec suite or cucumber suite in addition that's maybe as many lines of code. So that number 150, that's not like exaggerated. That's actually very conservative. There are Rails apps in production, uh, like Square, Living Social, Groupon. Like, they're, they're big apps that tend toward this number, and it's something we have to fight really hard. And, it, and people who work on these apps know that, uh, or Twitter, like, you know, um, earlier we heard about, it's hard, it takes a few hours to get set up with one of these code bases because they've grown so large. So put it another way, for every 25% increase in problem complexity, there is a 100% increase, I mean it's doubled, in solution complexity. That's, that's significant. When your problem gets a little bigger, the way you have to solve it is even more bigger. Is that a word? Uh, Scott Woodfield, 1979, right? This is, um, this again, which is measurements. Uh, this is a, a real problem. So as it grows, yes, you can do more, but, uh, but y over time, you'll be able to do far less. So this is why we build systems to relate across thin interfaces. So we can split these systems into pieces and make two dramatically simpler systems with the same overall set of features. Maintaining feature, feature parity with the same amount of stuff but simplifying the ways it's allowed to connect to itself. So to make this, to make code easy for you to edit, to make it strong, shrink the graph. Like that, that set of nodes, find a way to make it smaller. There are uh, three pretty handy ways to do this. One is just delete code. Like if you have a feature that you don't need, just delete it. 
It's great. The, uh, the best commits that go through at Square, the ones that get you celebrated all day when you merge them to master, are just full of red. They're like, oh my gosh, we're still able to, to function as a company, and you deleted 300 lines of code. You rock. You're an amazing engineer. Like, there are guys who, like, they just spend the afternoon with the delete key, going through methodically removing stuff we don't need, and, like, I consider them superheroes. Those are the geniuses. Anybody can add code. Anybody can type. But knowing how to remove stuff while keeping your app functional, that's brilliant. Because that means tomorrow you can actually do more. You can move faster. Another, uh, use or write a library, a gem. Uh, if you're in Ruby, a gem. If you're Python, an egg, whatever. Um, it's a great way to get stuff out. Or third, spin off a service. Maybe you need the code, but you don't need it running in that process. So a service it is. So a little more about the deletion. Do what Google did with, with Wave and with Buzz. They tried it. Not working so great. Axed it. Those developers are now working on something meaningful, hopefully. Um, or more recently, they shut down a lot of products because they didn't di directly contribute to the company's bottom line. Although, more realistically, I think it's because when you have done everything you can to split an application up into pieces, and you separate it into services, and you have it over thin interfaces, but the graph of services has gotten so big, you don't have many options. So you have to shut stuff down if you want to be able to move, if you want to be able to change. And Google has competition, so they had to shut a lot of things down. Uh, <laughs> novelists often tell each other and are advised by their editors, kill your darlings. That character that you love, that you wrote the book for, well, the book's better without them. So it's hard, but kill your darlings. Sometimes we have to do that with our code. You wrote this app for this one feature, but then you pivot and you're doing something else now. But that feature was so cool. Kill your darlings. It'll save you in the long run. Your code will be stronger. Your code will be more resilient because there will be less of it. And you've got Git, so you can always bring it back if you really need it. You wrote it once, which means you, you always have it with you. Uh, or extract code. So if you have code that could be extracted, you'll know it in one of two ways. One, you're not charging customers for that feature. That means it's just a, something you rely on to do your actual work, which means you can package it up and forget about it. You don't actually need to release it, but put it into a gem format, put it on your private GitHub account, and just point to its master branch in your gem file and just import it on your deploy. Um, one of the main benefits here is that you're no longer running some gems tests every time you create your build. You're now running just your tests, and this, this feature that is self-contained only has its tests run when you edit it, and you just use it. So your test suite actually speeds up quite a bit when you find all the things that are reusable, and you just move them out. Being if they're in the lib directory, chances are you can package them up and ship them off, and, then, and hopefully stuff in your lib directory also has tests. So if that's not the case, then you can't win that, that benefit. But Still, it's a good idea. Um, if you're interested in some examples of this, these are three gems extracted from my last project that uh, helped a lot. They were things that I realized I wasn't going to change. They did their job. They were great. And uh, I didn't need them anymore in, like, in active production. I just needed to rely on them. So, uh, so I put them into gems, sent them off, and I don't have to run those tests anymore. Bonus, other people get to use them. Uh, funny story about the middle one. Feminizer takes an arbitrary Ruby string and swaps the pronouns of any, or swaps the gender of any pronouns in it. So uh, a friend of mine hooked it up to his uh, Ubuntu box that he uses as a wireless router and opened up his Wi-Fi and all of his neighbors were connecting. But he made it so that anybody that wasn't his Mac address uh, had all their web pages filtered through this gem. So <laughs> they're reading CNN and it is weird. <laughs> like the president has something wrong with her. And uh, I'm, ve I'm very proud of that one. Uh, thirdly, uh, create a service. If you have something that needs to run, that, uh, that doesn't need to run in the same Ruby process, that is substantial, so not something trivial, not like something that you know, converts strings to integers or something small, but it's something substantial, but is also self-contained, make it a service. It, it'll, um, you're effectively taking this graph and you're just cutting it down the middle, and half stuff is going over there with its own test suite, and half stuff's going over here, and there's a thin interface across which they align. Uh, a good way to know if you need to, do, to spin off a service is if you always use a piece of your code in the same way, then it's probably that you should be developing an interface for it to, that is that one way that you'll access it, and then once you develop that interface, some class, some... So uh, uh, Gihard mentioned that Ruby doesn't have interfaces, not the VM level, but the whole thing is interfaces. Like, 
you define the surface area of any code is its interface. So define some surface area around some code you always use in the same way. And then uh, all, just access it through that point, and you can move it out into a different process, a different host, different part of the internet, uh, and the, your main app won't know. And just mock that out in your tests, but have a really clear schema about how they connect so that your mocks don't get out of date and you actually have bugs in production. Um, so good examples of this um, for how you can do it is uh, if you have a Rails app, you probably have action mailer templates. Um, I bring up this talk at a, at a RubyConf particularly because Rails is a fantastic prototyping framework, and it's great to get a real business app to the point that you can prove your business model. You can accept venture funding and prove the market. But at some point, that direction it set you off in is actually misleading, and you need to realize that was only ever for the beginning. You need to go a different direction. Your main app, unless you're SendGrid or Constant Contact or some, or like a MailChimp, it, it shouldn't worry about sending email. Um, I'll talk about more about that in a second. A analytics, that's great. It should be like in your service, in your business, but not in your app. Uh, there, you get a read slave, just run some stats on it. It's really helpful. It can have its own tests. Um, just update it when the schema changes. Um, or your dashboard. If you have some sort of admin dashboard, like it, it should also be tested and it should also not be in your app. Uh, all you need for email, this should say for email, but you know, the font size is too big, I got cut off, whatever. Um, all you need is this in your application. If you have more than this in your app, your main Rails app, you're making a huge mistake and missing out on a giant speed up. Not only of your specs, but of your app. Because, uh, and I don't have a slide for this, but this, I think it's a significant point. There's a lot of talk about how to speed up your specs or how to speed up your tests. The right way to speed up your tests is to speed up your app, not to hack your spe specs a little faster. Um, get your app actually moving faster. It's a real, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it's a real value that your users see. It's not just for your build machines and your developers. So if you have this, and email is a class that maybe it's actually also your active record model that handles email validation, whatever. But if it knows that deliver means post this JSON to some other service you've written that, uh, that knows how to receive just an email of a user, the name of a template, and a state bag, then, uh, then this other service, sorry, I got some microphone technical difficulties. Okay, fixing. Uh, then this other service that you've written, maybe it's also a Rails app, can do all kinds of really interesting things. Like uh, it can have templates in production that you can view because it's not corrupting your main Rails app production database. You're not like having to get real user data. It can uh, give you interesting analytics. It can decorate your outgoing mail. You can look at the uh, email address and say, oh, it's Gmail. Oh, they strip out all CSS files. You need to do inline styles. But that's too slow for most recipients. So, oh, these guys are using something else. We can probably just use a CSS file uh, or you know, an inline or a style sheet. Like, you can do interesting things. and send it off to SunGrid or whatever you ship it through. Uh, but primarily, it's not in your app. Like, if your app isn't about sending email, then that should be a service. Um, if you're interested at all in, no? Yeah, okay, so I got ahead of myself. This is what you get if you separate out your email sending from your application. All that kind of stuff for free. Just take a couple days and build an email sending app. It's really fun. You have like a model. It's really easy. It's a lot of fun. You get great value uh, and you don't slow down your app. Um, if you're interested in some more examples of this, there's some two really, really simple uh, things that I also extracted from the last couple projects, PDF service and barcode service. These are Sinatra apps that need a fat C binary to do what they're doing. One, you post HTML to it, and it just responds with a PDF. The other, you, uh, you just get a URL with some barcode number, and it returns you a JPEG, or whatever you dot JPEG dot ping, whatever you ask for. Um, they're really useful. They started in the Rails app, but the Heroku slug went from 25 megabytes to 99 megabytes, which is one short of Heroku's limit. So I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't have put that fat like WebKit embedded PDF conversion thing inside my app. So yeah, mistakes, right? Uh, I extracted that. It's running in a separate app on Heroku, and uh, my app is small again. So this is what you should aim for. Uh, your app starts as a, just a mess of things, but find ways to split it right down the middle because th there are as many nodes here, but there are fewer vertices. There are fewer edges connecting. So there's less complexity, but more importantly, each one is just a lot smaller. You can iterate on each half of this 
and I deliberately didn't name this because I don't know how your app is going to be split, but generally the stuff you're charging your customers for on one side and the stuff that that thing needs on the other side. Uh, and then define some simple interface across which it can, it can uh, communicate with the other thing. So strong code is functionally correct. It is easy for you to edit, but it is also easy for others to edit. Uh, again, others in your team, but also others who come after. Because all code is eventually legacy code. Um, and by eventually, I mean immediately. So if you use Git, you know that your project has a history. It has a past. Not so hard to imagine that it also has a future. You may or may not be in it, but even if you don't feel like being nice to yourself in the future, which you should, you're, you're worthy of that, uh, you should also at least be nice to the other people on your team or the other people who come after you who have to edit this code. Um, you have to prepare your code to be legacy code, to be a foundation on which other people can apply the features that are crucially immediately needed right away tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I just love doing this. Uh, our code isn't ours. It's a platform for the next developer. Why can't you quote yourself, right? Uh, <laughs> so I believe this, so I put it in quotes. Again, some, some guy or lady who writes code who just says things, disregard, if there's no data, disregard, unless you happen to believe from your own personal experience that it's true. Uh, none of us write finished code. We only ever build a platform on which other developers can add future capability. Whether that's our current team or developers who follow after us, all the code we craft is the foundation for someone else's work. If you carefully balance and rebalance your code to fit the problem domain just right, you'll always have a good foundation for future work. And you can't predict what features you'll need in a month, but you can predict that you will need new features that you will not have been able to anticipate in a month. So again, the easiest way to keep it good for legacy use is to keep it small. It's, uh, it's hard to work with big things. It's easier to work with small things. Uh, it might be a little conservative, might be a little generous, but let's guess that a, a good developer can read and comprehend about 200 lines of code in an hour. Let's just, maybe 150, maybe 300, I don't know. Depends on the language. But uh, let's say you've got an app that's 8,000 lines of interesting code. This is probably not true. It's probably 60,000 lines plus double that in tests. But let's say it's 8,000 lines. Uh, at 200 lines an hour, that will take that developer one week to read. And that's if, like, no breaks, like, no going to the bathroom. They are just focused 40-hour work week, you know, um, which is not going to be the case because day one they'll be asked to implement some crazy new feature. But let's say they were generous um, with this new person's time, whoever's running the project. That person would be a saint to not lobby for a complete rewrite for your terrible code just due to the size of it. Like, they can't get their mind around it. How are they supposed to work with this piece of crap that might be amazing, but it's so big that it's just they, they can't be effective. They thought they were smart, and now they're on this new project, and they feel really stupid. Uh, that's hard. You know, so uh, you can't do everything, but you can keep it small. Uh, secondly, name everything. Uh, naming is the place where you should be putting all your work. It's, the, it's all the effort you should be expending. Uh, typing, not hard. Deleting, not hard. Moving things around, talking about code, not hard. Naming what you're doing, hard. There's a lot of code, probably in your code base, that just happens to do the right thing. But if you read it, you don't know how. You have to think of it like a, through it like a computer because it doesn't say what it's actually doing. If you, you model your code and if you name your variables well, then you'll actually like, have this foundation in which somebody can sit down and just read what is going on and they know it and they understand it. Uh, they say you should write your code for both computers and humans, but don't write for humans. Write for you in six months or the person who comes after you that will actually read this. Like, think about how will this code be used. Don't name things after what it does. Name it after what purpose it serves. Name it after, is it safe to delete? Name it after, when should you delete it? Name it after, what feature was it part of? Uh, how is this actually relating to other things in the code base? Not thing that does awesome stuff fast, but like, if you have to name a method, or if you have to create a method that is a bad idea, that is like, it's a hack and you know it's a hack, call it def this is a bad idea, just so everybody knows. Like, just, be, just make it really clear, because you have the power to name things whatever you want. Uh, Phil Carlton is the most likely candidate for who said this quote. There are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. I think this is true with one caveat. Uh, if you use a cache that is able to, um, when the data store gets full, expire the least recently accessed item, 
then all you need to do is name your cache keys after the scope of space and time in which they are valid. So name them after the hour of the day or the city of the request or the deploy, put the deploy shot in there, and they will be invalidated at the right time. So really, there's one hard thing in computer science, naming things, because naming things well solves cache invalidation. So this is like, if you are curious where to spend your time, name the things that are happening in your code. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then rebalance everything. So if you're trying to like balance something on your hand that's really tall, like you have to kind of move around the base constantly to keep that thing on top from moving. Because if you're gonna put stuff up there, it can't just like fall over. So as your problem space that your company is addressing, that your app is addressing changes, you need to consistently rebalance your code. Now that doesn't mean add one new feature. It means as you add a new feature, adjust the rest of the code to account for that new feature. It may just be subtle shifts, but you can tell you're doing it right when a new person sits down at your code and does not know what problem you were solving six months ago because your code doesn't describe its history, your code describes the problem it's trying to solve and the solution it has chosen for that. You'll know you've done this if the history of your code is totally opaque to new people who sit down at it. You've rebalanced it, you've adjusted it. You can have technical debt, sometimes it's necessary, sometimes there are long methods, but at least addresses the current problem. Then it's a foundation for future work. Then someone's not paying off the debt from long ago. They they're have like a fresh start for their own work because there will be more features in the future than are demanded now. Oh, thank you. Um, right, your app should reflect its problem space, not the history of the app. Uh, and lastly, Peter Drucker is famous for a lot of things, but my favorite quote by him is, uh, what gets measured gets managed. If you don't have a number telling you how you're doing, you're not gonna try to change that number. So the things that are key in your business that you want to change, number of customers, uh, bounce rate on your homepage, you need to measure these or else you won't actually address them. Also, complexity in your code base, you need to measure this or you won't address it. Suddenly you'll just wake up and you've got 100,000 lines of code that you don't know where it came from and it's old and you're not sure if it's safe to delete because you were so focused on the other things that mattered and they did matter, but so did the complexity of your code base. Like if you, work, if you talk to somebody who's worked on a Rails code base that has grown over time, you can actually ask them, when did it stop being fun? And they'll tell you, like March of 2010. Oh, that was the worst. That's when we hit like, you know, 102 models. And then suddenly our specs took more than one machine could do, so we had to partition it out, and then that's on an EC2, but now we have concurrent issues, and sometimes it's a flaky build here, but we have to move machines, and it'll work over there. Like, at some point, the complexity becomes a serious problem. So measure it. Maybe you can endure it. Maybe you, like, your company needs to allow it to go complex for a while, um, or forever, but measure it, because it's better to be you know, like a 90 than 140. So you can at least address it somewhat. Uh, and if you don't have metrics about your project size, it's just gonna grow. Like people will just add things because they will see this as a foundation on which to add things, but they won't think that this is a broken foundation from which things should also be removed when they are no longer needed. Uh, there's some great ways to do this. One is metric foo. It is, I don't know, maybe it's an underscore instead of a dash, so just Google it. Um, but it's a grab bag of all the wonderful complexity measurements. You run this, it'll take a little while against your code base, it'll tell you a lot of, frankly, sad things about your code. <laughs> um, it, sometimes I think it takes a, a certain, like people say that engineers can be kind of jerks, but no, you have to be really humble to be an engineer because you do your best work and you're at like a great company doing good work and oh, oh, is that bad? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so run this and forgive yourself. You're actually smart. I like you. You should like you. But really, your code might be in a lot of pain. Speaking of pain, um, Ryan Davis, if you're watching this, Ryan Davis, I love you. Uh, he wrote Flog. Flog is great. Um, you run it against your code and your code gets to tell you how much pain it's in. <laughs> so you're like, code, how are you? What's your pain level? And it's like, 200! And, uh, and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I did that to you, uh, and you can address it. So run this against your code base from time to time, and then go cry in a dark, dark corner, and then uh, come back and fix it and clean it up. Uh, it will tell you exactly where things went wrong, so it's helpful. Um, also, good old word count. There's, uh, there's really nothing better or easier than wc-l star star slash star.rb. 
find out the total lines, including comments, whatever, of every Ruby source code file in your application, in your current directory. When that gets big, cut it in half. Like, just, just break it right in the middle. It'd be painful, but oh, you get like a 50% reduction immediately in complexity. It's great. Um, it's a really good feeling. So shrink the graph, find a way to do it. Um, you're all employed doing what you do because you're creative and smart and thoughtful people who know how to solve problems. So um, please tell me if you do it in a way other than the three ways I mentioned, but shrink the graph. The graph of all the interconnected pieces of your system. Find a way to move something out. Balance everything. When you have a chance to readjust your code that is problem solving to match the problem you're solving, find a way to do that. It's worth the time. And thirdly, measure your complexity. Uh, it's worth the investment because your job should be fun. What we do is we create enjoyable applications uh, that are, in applications that like, deliver value, but they're enjoyable for us to work on them. That's why we work with Ruby. That's why we work with interesting applications. That's why we build cool things. It's that joy at the beginning of a, of a project where you run rake, and there's a few green dots go across the screen, and it all passes. You're all done. Try to stay there as long as you can, um, or get back to there if you've left it. It's a wonderful feeling. You'll feel like your business can do anything when your code gets back down to size. That's strong code. <laughs>